Okay, we're about to begin chapter 3 today, and chapter 3 deals with the atomic theory, and we're actually going to start back, uh, well, several hundreds of years ago, back to 440 BC. We're going to talk about what, uh, what early philosophers felt that matter was composed of. Uh, in 440 BC, Greek philosopher Empedocles proposed that all matter was composed of four elements. He envisioned matter of being made up of either earth or water, um, air, which sometimes is referred to as wind, and you all know the last one, earth, water, air, and you got it. You've heard this before, haven't you? Fire. Now, if you could imagine um, a tree. So here's my really bad drawing of a tree. And you could obviously see how perhaps a philosopher at that time felt that that tree um, started out as a little sprout and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, where did that matter come from for it to get bigger? Well, obviously it, it came from the earth, didn't it? The earth composed the matter of that tree, along with, of course, the water, because if you chop that tree down, you can see moisture inside that tree. You can see the sap. So that tree contains earth and water. And as the wind blew, of course, that's creating air. And then every once in a while, of course, a tree would catch on fire. Or perhaps they'd take part of that tree and they'd throw it in their fireplace and they would burn it. And then we would see fire. So a tree you could see was composed of all four of these elements, a mixture of all four. So that was the early belief that uh, all matter was composed of either one or a mixture of these four different elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Now around, around the same time, another Greek philosopher called Democritus suggested that the uh, world was only made up of two things. He did not have any experimental evidence like Empedocles had. I mean, Empedocles had his tree, didn't he? But Democritus didn't have any way to prove this. He believed that all matter was composed of two things. Are you ready for this? Tiny indivisible particles he called atoms. Isn't that interesting? And that came from the Greek word atomos. And then he also thought that matter was composed of a lot of this empty space. Now we had no experimental evidence to prove this. This was much more easily understood, the Empedoclean theory. Um, to further uh, uh, Democritus' explanation, he believed that atoms of solids um, had sharp corners on them and would interlock with each other, whereas atoms of liquids were smoother and they could slide past one another. So his belief was very general and was not supported by experimental evidence. Once again, around that same time still, the philosopher Aristotle lived, and he opposed the Democritus theory, and he endorsed, endorsed an advanced Empedoclean theory. So we just heard that name a few moments ago, Empedocles. He proposed that matter was not made up of smaller particles. He proposed that all matter was continuous. He called this substance hyle, and hyle could change from one form of matter to another could change from earth into fire, or it could change from water into vapor or wind. Um, and that matter could change, and that was all called Hyle. Now, so powerful were Aristotle's views that they dominated scientific theory until the beginning of the 17th century. Now, that's the 1600s. Now, he lived approximately three or 400 years BC. So that was almost 2,000 years where Aristotle's beliefs held true and held fast. Um, in the mid to late 1600s, a couple other scientists now came on the scene and they began to uh, question um, Aristotle and uh, the way of thinking. They both published, ar published articles stating their belief in the atomic nature of elements, but they really didn't have any evidence to prove their theory. In the mid to late 1700s, an experiment was done by Anton Lavoisier. He um, created something called the Law of Conservation of Mass, and he proposed that in ordinary chemical reactions, matter cannot be changed, or excuse me, matter can be changed in many ways, but it cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. 
Let me illustrate that with this image here. Um, if he took 100 grams of mercuric oxide and heated it strongly, after he did that, he would collect 92.61 grams of mercury and 7.39 grams of oxygen. Now, of course, the sum of these two masses, 7.39 and 92.61, add up to the 100.00 grams of the mercuric oxide. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, but the atoms were rearranged. In this case, they were decomposed into their elements. We can even consider a candle burning. Let's say we had a dome. And we placed a candle inside that dome. And we lit that dome, or lit that candle on fire. Now let's go ahead and put this on some type of balance. This is a really crude drawing of a balance here. And we'll put a certain mass on this side of my balance. This is getting really bad, isn't it, folks? Now, what would happen as that candle got smaller and smaller and smaller? Well, one might think that this side of the balance would tip down because the, the, the mass inside this jar would be getting smaller because that candle was disappearing. But in fact, the atoms are just rearranging themselves. Aren't they turning themselves? Aren't they turning into carbon dioxide and water vapor and remaining inside that that container so the mass would not change. The mass before reaction is the same as the mass after the reaction. So those particles can rearrange themselves, but we can't destroy them. They're always going to be with us. Shortly after, an individual named Joseph Proust came up with something known as the law of definite. My handwriting's bad today, isn't it? Composition. And sometimes you'll see this referred to as the law of constant. Oops, sorry. Constant composition. He observed that certain substances contain elements in the same ratio by mass. If we consider table salt, no matter where the sample is obtained or how large the sample was, the ratio of the mass of sodium to the mass of chlorine never changes. So we could collect that salt from the Great Salt Lake and analyze the amount of sodium to chlorine by weight and we could collect some uh, sodium chloride uh, from the Dead Sea or we could collect, could collect it from a salt mine somewhere and analyze the amount of sodium compared to chlorine and that ratio would never change no matter where that was collected or how big the sample was. Let's use this example. Let's say I had 100 grams of lead or excuse me 10 grams of lead and 1.56 grams of sulfur if I react those in that ratio, I would create 11.56 grams of lead sulfide. So it's a 10 to 1.56 gram ratio would give me that much lead sulfide. Well, what if I had 10 grams of lead and I reacted it with 3 grams of sulfur instead of 1.56? I would still collect 11.56 grams of lead sulfide and I would have 1.44 grams of sulfur remaining. I'd have leftover sulfur. Now we can flip that around. Let's say um, we use 1.56 grams of sulfur this time, and we use 18 grams of lead. And I reacted those together. I would still produce 11.56 grams of lead sulfide, but this time I'd have some excess lead, an 8 gram sample of lead left over. So you'll notice no matter how I react these or in what ratio I react them in, the product will always combine with a definite composition. Okay. Once again, certain substances contain elements in the same ratio by mass. All right. Then along came John Dalton. John Dalton tried to explain the work of Lavoisier and Proust, those two individuals we just finished talking about. He felt if atoms cannot be destroyed, notice we're using the word atom here, then they must simply be rearranged in a chemical uh, chemical change. The total number and kind of atoms has to stay the same during that change. Therefore, the mass before a chemical reaction must be equal to the mass after the chemical reaction. Think about that for a minute. If the atoms of an element are always alike, then all atoms of a particular element must have the exact same mass. So all atoms of lead, regardless of where you find them, are like all other atoms of lead. And the same is true of sulfur and any other element. 
So how does this apply to the sodium chloride example? Well, all sodium atoms have the same mass, and all chlorine atoms are, have the same mass. Therefore, the ratio of the mass of sodium to the mass of chlorine must always be the same for any sample of table salt. He then stated a second law based on his own atomic uh, theory, but not based on experimental data. He didn't do experiments himself. He, he was actually quite a clumsy person, as uh, legend has it in the laboratory. But he did draw upon the correct conclusions from experiments of others. He found that elements can combine with each other to form compounds in different ratios. This became known as the law of multiple proportions. The law of multiple proportions. So that simply tells us that atoms come together, or we'll say atoms combine, in simple, and I'll say small, whole number ratios. Now that ratio doesn't always have to be the same. For instance, um, there are two oxides of iron. They exist in different ratios with completely different chemical and physical properties. Iron and oxygen can come together in a one-to-one -one ratio. Notice simple whole number ratios. Or iron and oxygen can come together in a different compound, iron three oxide, and it comes together in a two to three ratio, or a one iron to one and a half oxygen ratio. So we have the same elements coming together, but there are multiple proportions. It doesn't always have to be one to one or two to three. I have another example for you. If I were to take one gram of carbon, I can combine it with 1.333 grams of oxygen and form a compound carbon monoxide. But I could also combine it with exactly twice the amount of oxygen, 2.666, and end up with CO2. So twice as much oxygen um, in that formula. Once again, the atoms are coming together in simple, pretty, whole number ratios. So atoms, we believe, cannot be divided into smaller particles. So Dalton went on to propose the first atomic theory based upon experimental facts. Once again, not necessarily experiments that he did, but experiments and knowledge that he gained from others like Lavoisier and Proust. So number one, elements composed, elements are composed of minute indivisible particles called atoms. Atoms of the same element are alike in size and in mass. Number three, atoms of different elements have different masses and different sizes. So an atom of gold will be a different size and a different mass than an atom of lead or an atom of carbon and so on. Chemical compounds are formed by the union of two or more atoms of different elements coming together. Atoms combine to form compounds in simple numerical ratios such as 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 2 to 3 and so on. And atoms of elements may combine in different ratios to form more than one compound like our iron, and oxygen, our carbon and oxygen example we just spoke of, or nitrogen and oxygen come together in many different ratios. To wrap this up for the day, we'll just talk about uh, Joseph Gay-Lussac and one other individual that lent credibility to Dalton's theories. Uh, Gay-Lussac, in the early 1800s, made an interesting observation while studying the behavior of gases. He noted that under constant conditions, the volumes of reacting gases, so not masses, but the volume of that gas and reacting products are in a ratio of simple small whole numbers, exactly as Dalton had theorized. And then finally for today, we'll talk about Amadeo Avogadro, who also lent credibility to Dalton's theory. Avogadro's hypothesis also concerned gases. He stated that equal volumes of gases under the same conditions have the same number of particles or molecules as we began to call them. This helped to explain Gay-Lussac's observation and this also led to the widespread theory or acceptance of Dalton's theory. So we'll stop there. Obviously this is not the current model of the atom. The current model of the atom is much more complex than the Dalton model of the atom. The Dalton model of the atom could be considered to be the billiard ball model, like a pool ball, where it's just a simple sphere 
that cannot that cannot be broken down into anything smaller. And atoms of different elements have different sizes, different volumes, different masses, etc. So we'll stop there with the Dalton model of the atom. We talk uh, in the next video. We'll talk about an individual named J.J. Thompson and some of his discoveries. So thanks for your time. See you later.